Uh, welcome to part two of the gene expression module. In this part, we want to talk about transcriptomics, but how we do the data processing. And that involves an awful lot of computer science, bioinformatics, uh, and an awful lot of, of uh, number theory to be able to deal with the statistics that come from this, uh, this challenge as well. Now, uh, it's easy to think that bioinformatics is one thing, uh, and that there's a fairly simple structure to all of this, but in fact, bioinformatics uh, comes in a lot of different flavors along the way. So if, if we uh, look at the upper right, uh, we can see that questions of how we store our data are bioinformatics, how we integrate data sets together com comp comprises bioinformatics, how we visualize data comprises bioinformatics. Now let's think more about the cycle that's shown here, and, and this is a, an important thing to keep in mind. Anytime we do an experiment, we want to get information that informs the next experiment we would do. So this is kind of the virtuous cycle for us. We start with a biological question. We design an experiment that allows us to interrogate that question. We do transcriptome profiling in this case to measure gene expression. Then we have to go through some, uh, now, now we're finally getting to the things that we think of as bioinformatics and biostatistics. We do data pre-processing. We're going to talk about the example of normalization. We do data mining that uh, allows us to interrogate the data and come away with biological insights. Now, we tend to see that falling into three basic patterns uh, within uh, microarray experiments and RNA-seq experiments. Those are differential expression, clustering, and classification. So those three we're going to feature in a, a slide of their own just to talk about them. And of course, from that, we need to be able to do some sort of biological interpretation, for example, using the gene ontology as a way to understand the relationships among genes that we find to be differential. This leads to a new hypothesis generation. Uh, so having done this experiment, we've, uh, we've hopefully answered the question that we started the experiment with, and we've come away with information that leads us to the next question. So this is a hypothesis generation step. We can then do verification of these experiments to try in another cohort to see if our standings actually uh, uh, stand up to scrutiny, which brings us to a new biological question. So this is the virtuous cycle, and bioinformatics plays a very key role in producing the information we glean from each experiment. So normalization is a very important process. Imagine that you are pipetting samples to prepare for another gene expression experiment. How reliably are you getting exactly 100 microliters uh, pipetted from one, uh, one tube to another? Sometimes you might have 96, and sometimes you might have 104, and sometimes you might have right on at 100. That might cause all of the genes in one sample run on this plate to look slightly uh, less intense than they would be on this other microarray. Being able to normalize these plates then gives us the ability to uh, compare among these measurements. Now there are a lot of ways to do this. One of the ways that's most popular is the housekeeping, ge housekeeping gene approach. We assume that certain proteins like actin are, uh, are not changing very much in expression. So we compare every uh, gene's expression to that of actin and the other housekeeping genes, and we hope that that normalizes away all these differences. The fact is, though, that uh, the, the transcripts that we think of as always on at a, at a constant level are not. So housekeeping, the housekeeping gene approach has really fallen into disrepute. What if we could uh, control all of these data so that uh, they all had the same median or the same mean, so we could figure out what number we need to multiply each microarray by to force the, the means to be the same, for example. That's called a global normalization. It's shown in the second plot there. So it doesn't change the distribution of the, the gene uh, expression measurements that we have, but it does uh, alter them all so that they center on the same value. <clears throat> Another approach is quantile normalization, where we try to alter all the distributions as well so that they are uh, distributed similarly and have the same common value. Uh, that's not to say that all that the that in an individual gene will have the same value across arrays, but that the distributions will be shaped the same. So quantile normalization is another possibility. There's a, a visualization of that at the right. So the three chief the three chief goals that we see in gene expression studies are class comparison, class detection, and class prediction. So I've I've uh, Phrase the first one as the question, which genes differentiate these cohorts? 
So I'm going to do differential gene expression analysis. I'm going to start with a whole pile of gene expression data and, critically, a class label. So perhaps I have 50 controls and 50 cases, or maybe I have 10 cases and 50 controls. You, know, you never are guaranteed having exactly the same numbers. So in this case, um, case or control is the label that we apply to each microarray, and we decide, we uh, measure which genes are most, uh, are most differential from one cohort to the other. That's the class comparison uh, application. Next is class detection. So sometimes we don't know as much about these data as we might like, and we want to ask if the data sort related samples together. So uh, if, you, if you had a bunch of colon cancer cases, for example, and you wanted to ask, how does transcription sort together patients in this, in this uh, colon cancer cohort? It, it, you might be able to recognize that this type of colon cancer is a subtype with very different treatment prospects than this other type. That's class detection. So we would use clustering analysis for that, starting from gene expression data, but here we're allowing the data to tell us what their labels are, in effect. Uh, we, we sort them based on similarity. We'll talk about that in another slide. And class prediction is in many ways the big deal. This is the, the biomarker or signature approach, that you have a, uh, a lot of data for people who fall into different categories, and you want to see if you can learn enough about them that you can construct a signature that allows you to classify new unknown samples. Clever, right? So that, that's class prediction. These rely very heavily on machine learning techniques, uh, such as random forest or uh, support vector machine. Those are ones that you see most frequently uh, in, at present, but it changes all the time because machine learning is a very, very fast moving field. So for this, <clears throat> we want a training set in which we have, we have gene expressions along with labels that describe where they fall within the hierarchy. And the output from this is going to be a prediction model, basically saying, uh, although you measured 40 some thousand transcripts. The only ones you actually need to pay attention to are say these 10 and knowing the values for these 10 will allow you to classify new unknowns into the proper class. So class prediction is a fairly complex operation with a lot of machine learning associated with it. Uh, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning approaches, for example, uh, this is a great place for you to be working. So let's start with the term by clustering. This was uh, introduced around the turn of the millennium uh, by someone in George Church's lab. So uh, a method that simultaneously clusters genes and conditions, finding distinctive checkerboard patterns in matrices of gene expression data if they exist. All right, now I, I wanna try to break down that diagram that you see at the right. So cell lines here are being used to, uh, we're, we're profiling which transcripts are most common across all these cell lines. So we've got all of these blue ones, one, two, three, four, I can't, I'm not even going to count them all, but maybe 20 some cell lines. Each one has been analyzed on a microarray. Now we are going to ask which cell lines are most similar based on their patterns of transcripts. So clustering is happening in the cell line axis, sorting together those with the most similar gene expression patterns. Similarly, we can look at each row across this. So each row shows the expression value seen for a particular gene in cell line one, cell line two, cell line three, cell line four. Now we're going to cluster together those rows that show the most similar patterns of expression across cell lines. So it's quite the same operation as we were doing in the cell line axis, grouping together the cell lines that were most similar. Now we're going to sort together which genes are most similar to each other. And that produces one of these uh, these uh, bi-clustering uh, images, a checkerboard. Uh, so we see that uh, maybe we're using red to represent up in this case. So we see that genes that are up uh, are clustered at the top uh, and, and uh, are found, mo uh, found in this, uh, this blue set of cell lines. Those, uh, so we, one of the things that we typically do with this is not do all 47,000 transcripts, but rather just focus on those that show the greatest variation across the cell lines. That makes it a, a whole lot more compact to make one of these bi-cluster plots. So clustering plots are one of the most frequent things that we see to visualize the results coming back from one of these uh, class assessment exercises. 
it's really important to talk about statistics when we discuss microarrays. So uh, many people, I think, are familiar with students' t-test. Uh, so let's talk about how that would apply. In this case, I have a case of the three pink col uh, a case cohort of the three pink columns, and I have a control cohort of the three green columns. In a t-test, I'm asking for each gene, uh, do I uh, do I see the same abundance values across the case cohort as I do across the control cohort? The, one of the typical ways that we do this is a t-test, but I want to be very clear that the t-test is evaluating this null hypothesis. The null hypothesis being that there is no difference between these two cohorts. All right, that's a that's a very conservative estimate. That is to say, there is no difference, uh, no real difference in the the uh, value of uh, of expression for this gene across these two cohorts. So, if you see a p-value of five percent come from such a t-test, it's saying that under the assumption that there's no difference in these two cohorts, there's only a 5% chance that we would see this extreme of difference by random chance alone. Okay? So the null hypothesis that's being tested at the bottom there, you see the, that mu1 equals mu2. That's statistical shorthand for saying that the mean value we see for the case cohort is the same as the mean value we see for the control cohort. Okay, so let's move ahead. Now there are there are a lot of tools out there to help you in the statistics with microarray analysis. One of the biggest ones is LIMA. That is the Linear Models for Microarray Data. It's highly standard in this field. It's part of a really amazing package of tools for biostatistical and bioinformatic analysis. Bioconductor is a very, very big deal. If you've not encountered Bioconductor in all of your uh, look at bioinformatics, you should really give it a glance. There are tools within Bioconductor for almost any conceivable bioinformatic task, even out to proteomics, the field where I work. So uh, one of the ones that I'm highlighting here is LIMA, the Linear Models for Microarray Data, because it's really, really standard within the practice of microarrays. And it includes a special variant of t-test. In t-test, you're comparing uh, these, the, the means between these two cohorts, but you have to have some estimate of the variance within these cohorts to do so. In, in the ordinary t-test, the variance is drawn from just the measurements for this gene within this cohort and within this cohort. But LIMA has a really special one called this Empirical Bayes Moderated t-test. And it thinks that you can do a whole lot better at estimating variance if you look at all of the genes at once for getting your estimate of variance, not just this one gene. So that's a very powerful tool. And LIMA uh, has has really uh, revolutionized the way that a lot of people deal with their, their microarray data. It's a hugely standard package. I must say, however, that when we use statistical testing across all of these genes, we have thousands of genes, thousands of transcripts that we're evaluating, and that implies that we're doing thousands of difference tests, statistical difference tests. We need to protect ourselves against errors. There are just two um, major approaches that, and a thousand others that we could talk about, but I, I want to just raise these two. The first of these is a very conservative correction called Bonferroni. A Bonferroni correction is intended to protect you from making any false claims at all that there are differences to be found in transcripts when there are none to be found. So Bonferroni is very useful to know for that, but it's, it's very, very conservative. As a result, many people use what's called false discovery rate control instead which is intended to not protect you from making any mistakes, but rather to limit the rate at which you make false, uh, false assessments of difference. So you might control uh, to a level of, say, 5%. Uh, no more than 5% of the differences that are called by the software are false. So you might use Benjamini Hochberg for that purpose. Now, gene expression omnibus is something we must talk about. There are more than 4,000 data sets that have been made public with all of the, the data from these microarrays stored at Gene Expression Omnibus. Uh, if you are studying a disease that has ever been evaluated in gene expression, you can probably find the data in GEO. So I would strongly suggest you take a look there if you're interested in working in this area. So gene expression uh, needs contributions from both bioinformatics and biostatistics. Bioconductor and GEO are very important resources in this space, uh, and you should certainly take a look at their, uh, what, what's there. We always want to be able to refine our hypotheses. That's what science is about. Thank you.